How could you possibly ruin an Elvis Presley story? It seems like an instant win. Or at least that's what I thought whenever I first heard this movie was being made. I saw the first trailer, and to be honest, uh, when I first heard the, I first saw the first tra the first little teaser, I heard Tom Hanks' voice, and I my first thought was, please don't let Tom Hanks play Elvis Presley, because you know he plays everything in every biopic. He's Mister Rogers. He's Captain Solenberger. He's that captain uh, the, in that on that ship on that one movie. Uh, he's I mean, he's a good actor, but he doesn't have to play everything, even if he doesn't fit. I thought he was going to play Elvis, and I'm like, please don't let this be. <laughs> but no, he wasn't. Thank God, he was not playing Elvis. He was playing uh, Colonel Tom Parker, who was basically Elvis's uh, manager. Who I actually will get into that. Elvis was played by Austin Butler, who I honestly had never heard of before. The film was directed by a name I know I've heard before, but I can't tell you who it is. <laughs> uh, I am looking at the wrong note. I made notes. Ah, here we go. Baz Luhrmann? I know I am saying that wrong. Hey, Google. Hey, Google, who directed Elvis? Elvis was directed by Baz Luhrmann. Oh, I was, I was close. Anyway, wait, what else did he direct? It doesn't say. Point is, ah, uh, okay, so you, you probably noticed, by the way I opened this, I wasn't the biggest fan. I just got back. I literally, I just got back from watching this movie. Uh, as soon as I wasn't going to make a review of this, I was, I was like, I don't have to review every movie I watch because I want this podcast to have a variety of movies. I want it to be new movies, old movies, obscure movies, movies everyone's heard of. And now this is my second episode, and both of them are movies I just walked out of the theater from. So, I mean, at some point, I'm going to have to review something else. But I just... Okay, so I was really excited for this movie. And it wasn't a bad movie, it's just... Okay, so for this one, it was kind of a last-minute watch. I was at a friend's house earlier, and my another friend of mine, a friend Stephanie, messaged me and was like, "Hey, let's go watch Elvis. We were gonna watch it on Sunday, but we were both bored." And I was like, "She was like, we were texting, and I was like, what are you doing, Leonard?'" And she's like, "I'm not doing anything. Let's go watch Elvis." And I'm like, "All right." So we went and watched Elvis. It's kind of spur of the moment. I don't know what we're doing Sunday now. <laughs> we just we just watched the movie we were going to watch on Sunday, and so. It was, uh, okay, how long is this movie? Hey, Google, how long is Elvis? It's like two hours, 39 minutes. The running time of Elvis is two hours and 39 minutes. Ah, yeah, I was right. I think I said three hours on accident. Two hours, 39 minutes. It did not feel that. Um, I'm going to quote my friend. As we were leaving the theaters, she literally said, that felt more like a four-hour movie. And, yeah, she's right. It it felt a lot longer than it was. It, I'm not going to lie, it was kind of a mess of a movie. It started off at the end, which, when it, as soon as it started, I was thinking, oh, it's going to show the end, like right before his last performance, and then it's going to rewind and tell the story. From, but, no, it, I mean, it kind of did that, but it did it. In a very weird way, it had kind of an Ang Lee film style, like from like Hulk, like two thousand three or whatever, where I was doing like split screen and different panels, were showing multiple shots in the same screen, and you know it was interesting. I liked that; that was unique, you know, in a in a way. I mean, it's been done before. Obviously, I gave an example, but it was, you know, it's not something you see in every single movie. So, I mean. But the way it told the story was kind of incoherent. Like, there were too many time jumps forward and backwards. 
and it was almost hard to keep up with sometimes. And you definitely fail the wrong time, like I said. And one thing that just really kept, I kept feeling the whole time. I love Tom Hanks. He's a great actor. I love him to death. I, I like him in almost everything he's in. And I like him in this too. He did a great job. However, I do feel the character, I do feel he was miscast. As I'm watching, as I'm watching him as, as Colonel Tom Parker, I couldn't help thinking that he was doing an impersonation of Anthony Hopkins. I, I honestly feel Anthony Hopkins would have been a better cast, a better um, choice for that role. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I don't know how everyone else feels about it. I, I told I told my friend, I was like, I think Anthony Hopkins. And she was like, hmm, that is interesting. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins, that's, that's interesting. And so, I... Again, I do like this movie. It did have... It was kind of a good tribute to Elvis. A good in, you know, quotation marks. It had... It was... What was what was the guy's name again? I forgot. <laughs> uh, That's awkward. I, I'm i trying to do this in as few takes... I'm trying to do this as few takes as possible. Austin Butler. He did a fantastic job. He was the perfect Elvis. Like... The acting again, kind of like with the black phone. I had no complaints about with with like the acting. Like as as much as I wish Anthony Hopkins had been the role of Colonel, Tom Hanks did a really great job as he always does. I just feel Anthony Hopkins would have done better. How um, Austin Butler, <laughs> Austin Butler was the perfect Elvis. For that role. And I knew that going in. Because like I've seen him on some of the late night. Things and like. I loved watching him. In his interviews because he was kind of shy. And awkward and he's like. I, uh, I'm not really a. Loud person and here I am on stage. Doing all this. And then they had him do some of his impersonations. On one of the. I forgot which one it was. But yeah, like uh, especially the I really felt it whenever he did the suspicious minds uh, on stage um, on in the movie. I was like, he was Elvis Presley. He did a fantastic job in that role. Which kind of sucks because like it, they try to fit his whole life into the into the two hours thirty nine minutes, which. They could have done if they had made it more coherent. There was a kind of halfway through the film, they like they do a math, they do they do like this huge time jump, the kind of a musical montage through his career. They skipped so much because he did so much in the uh, in his life. He did so much, and they just kind of skipped over a lot of stuff. And I just, it was kind of a missed opportunity. But I did notice there was a kind of a theme going on that I did notice that um, kind of the story with uh, Colonel uh, Colonel Tom Parker. I I actually didn't know the story until I was about to go in. Like I said, I was at my best friend's house and I was uh, talking to them when I was, I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna go see Elvis tonight with Stephanie," and then. Um, uh, I was talking, I was, like I said, I thought Tom Hanks was going to be Elvis. I'm like, oh no. My best friend's mother comes out and says, oh yeah, he's playing Colonel Tom Parker. I was like, oh, who's that? You don't know who Tom Parker is? No. And so she explained to me uh, kind of what it was, is that he was basically Elvis's manager, but he was completely taking advantage of him the whole time and like wouldn't let him do what he wanted to do. That's the reason that he was stuck in uh, in Vegas. Like the back end of his career, he was stuck in, he was literally stuck in Vegas because um, Tom Parker tricked him. Uh, basically, um, <clears throat> kind of forced him into that. Like he, he was basically was like, oh yeah, you just do this one show and then do this uh, for six weeks and then you can tour the world. Elvis wanted to tour the world because he never left the country. 
So that's something I didn't know. I figured, you know, Elvis Presley, the biggest star in the world, he, you know, he tore the he tore the world, and, he, and no, he never left the country. There's even a scene near the end, like I want to go to Japan and Germany, but I, I've never left the country, and so, it's like, eh. um, and Tom Parker was like, just do th just do this show in Vegas at the International Hotel for six weeks, and you can do whatever you want. But like while he was doing that, he kind of like under the table, like made a deal with the the hotel, like oh you get exclusive rights to Elvis for the next however many years, and without Elvis's consent. But like he could do that because he was the manager. And he was a really scummy person, like, and it's really portrayed that uh, something I liked that they did in the movie. I, at first, I thought they were gonna portray it like oh. Um, here's the, you, you thought that I was a villain, but here's what really happened. And then tell like a fictionalized version that made him be the hero. He was in, um, Tom, Tom Hanks's Colonel Tom Parker was basically the narrator, but he was an unreliable narrator, which is great. You don't see that very often because he was basically like, Oh, I I did everything I could. Everything was for the benefit of El of Elvis Presley, and I did everything I could, and nobody loved him more than I did. But like on screen, like he was saying that, but then on screen, he was completely different. And something I, I here's what that's the thing the thing I noticed that I love that they did. Elvis and Priscilla were like they didn't really care about like the big luxury things at first i don't know about later in life they, they didn't show too much later in life they just kind of skipped over a lot but they didn't at first they didn't really care about the big luxury stuff they were because like tom was basically wanting to do all these this this and that and all that and there was a few scenes where like there uh Tom I mean um Elvis and Priscilla were watching the news when uh Dr. King got shot and they they were focused on that that's what they want that's what they wanted to watch but Tom like turned it off and was like no 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 we got a show to do and then later whenever Bobby Kennedy was shot same thing we're like the sh um they were like rehearsing for like uh um a show and then Everything just abruptly stops, and Bobby Kennedy's been shot. And everyone watches the news, and then um, someone's like, "Someone needs to make a someone needs to make a statement." Elvis, you need to make a statement. And then Tom Parker barges in. No, 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 no. You we got a show to do. This has nothing to do with us. So like that happens a bunch throughout the show, uh, throughout the movie. So I like that aspect of it, where it shows how scummy he was and it really shows in a bunch of scenes like the scummy things he did and he does get called out in the movie but like he keeps like oh no 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 elvis does at one point try to to leave him like no you're fired and then tom's like all right you owe me eight million dollars <laughs> for everything that i've done for you and basically forces elvis to stick with him until he eventually dies and, uh, and there's a I don't mind giving spoilers in this one because, I mean, everyone kind of... I didn't know the story of Tom Parker. Apparently, everyone else did because, they were, cause like, my best friend's mother was like, you didn't know Tom Parker? You don't know the colonel? I'm like, no. But then everyone else was like, yeah, Tom Parker. <laughs> he was, like, a big thing. And, and like, I think I, I was just interested in the music. I didn't really know too much about his life. And so, like, that might have something to do with it. I I didn't know that much about his life. But the movie... I think the reason they kind of skip over everything is because... They just assume everybody knows everything about Elvis. Like, oh, it's Elvis. He's the biggest star in the world. You already know all this stuff. So why are we going to tell you what you already know? Let's just skip past all that. No, I don't know that. I don't know all that stuff. Tell me the stuff. I only know what you're telling me. And because there's all these gaps... It's just, it's just, because of that, it just, okay, a, a, a way I could think of to picture this, the Harry Potter films, they filmed them assuming you already read the books, so they don't explain things, so the people that have read the books have to explain to the people who haven't read the, read the books, 
like, why are they doing this? Why haven't they done that? I thought they were, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, that's how this is. I don't know Elvis's story. They're assuming I do. And then, so, like, I probably would have enjoyed it more if I knew his story. If I was, like, this big super fan and didn't need to have all this stuff filled in. I did a qu I did kind of quick research on Tom Parker like on the way there just so cuz like I didn't had had my best friend's mother not mentioned him at all. I would have gone in just assuming, "Oh yeah, so he's you know, he's the manager. He's a good guy. Yay. He found all this and helped him. Yay." Cuz he is kind of like at first he is kind of shown like that. Like, "Oh, he found he found this new star, raging star." And then he slowly throughout the film becomes scummy. But if you go in knowing what happened, you're like, oh, this guy's just this guy's a dirt this guy's just a scumbag. And yet you can see it from the beginning, but if you know what to look for, if I had known from the beginning, his story would have made more sense. So, I mean But because I don't know his story, to me it was an incoherent mess. And same with my friend, like we both aren't like we're I'm a fan of Elvis in the sense that I like his music, but I don't know his story that well. So to me and to my friend it was an incoherent mess. And for two hours and thirty nine minutes, they really could have done a better job of it telling the story. They went more for um kind of like an artistic take on it, which it's not bad. I do like what they do, like the music in it. They take some of Elvis's music and there's like, it is kind of a musical because there's always music playing. Like, I mean, that's a, it's a movie. There's always music playing, but there's always Elvis. There's the actual music playing, the actual Elvis music playing, but then there's like Austin, um, the actor, oh, crap, it, there's him. Uh, singing and this, uh, it's, they like remix the stuff. Austin Butler, that's his name. <laughs> they, there is a lot of like kind of Elvis remix into this, and they put a lot of modern music. It's one of those I've seen this trend in movies in the last decade, and I don't know if I like it or not. Where it's a period piece, like The Great Gatsby takes place in the twenties. But they've got like Jay Z playing in it, I think, I, or rap music. They got, I think it's Jay Z. Someone said it was Jay Z. I know Fergie plays in one of the songs. Like a little party never killed nobody. It's on Just Dance, and I didn't know it was from Great Gatsby until someone's like, "Oh yeah, that's from Great Gatsby." I'm like, "That's from Great Gatsby." <laughs> then I watch the movie, and I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> they put modern music in this period piece," and that's what they did here. They put a lot of a lot of rap music into it, which it was good. I liked it. And it seemed, it fit the scenes, just not the time period, you know? You would you would expect a, a scene that takes place in the 60s to have 60s music. But it fit the theme they were going with. There was a lot of lights and colors. And I liked that. Um, was more colors than I was expecting. Which, I know that probably sounds weird, but I've noticed that since uh, John Wick kind of introduced color into films, you've been see I've been seeing a lot more color variety. Like, there's scenes where, like, um, Elvis is lit, backlit by, like, blue lights. And, I, it, I don't know. To me, it is... It's something I haven't really seen before for like the last few years. Ever since John Wick, it was like everything was like pink and blue and green and mixed of colors. And I noticed that like uh, Bullet Train is like kind of the same way. It has like the same uh, multicolored lights, uh, and that's like the feel I get from that. It's like it has like a John Wick feel because of the multicolors, and like I got that from this too at some point where there was like so many colors and. I don't know. I I liked that. I there's there's elements of this movie that I liked, but overall I really feel they could have done a better job. Kind of like tightening it up a little bit. Maybe like not mess with the whole time jump. Okay, I get opening at the end and then 
cutting back to the beginning. But I wish once they cut to the beginning with him as a kid and running into the revival and and like doing all that. Just, it's keeping it chronological after that instead of just jumping around and just making it so confusing and incoherent. That's the only, that's the best way I can the best way I can describe this movie is an incoherent mess. Which I know that sounds cliche. It's overused. I hate when people say that. But that's that's what I get from this. I don't regret seeing it cuz I I did like it like I said. I just yeah. Um, something I've been doing since high school is rating movies on a scale of 1 to 10, and I realized after I uploaded my review of The Black Phone, I forgot to rate it. I was going to uh, rate every single one of these movies. Uh, that one I rate a 9 out of 10. Um, this one I rate a 6 out of 10, which is not bad, but it's not great. <laughs> As for now, I for the, this podcast, I'm mm, I still don't have like an intro or outro. I at this at the point at this moment, it's like a spinoff of the digressor. Uh, so I I'm just it's kind of like a fun side thing. Like I'm trying to do as little editing as possible, even though the last the first episode, the black phone, that's like probably the most editing I've done in an episode. <laughs> And I'm, I want, that's why I'm trying to do this in one take. I'm trying to do this all in one take. That other one, you can probably tell, there's, like, parts where, like, I kind of, like, I would record, like, a word or two and then splice it in. And you can really tell because the quality changes. And I'm like, oh, that's the best I can do. And I'm like, nope, I don't want to do that. I just want to do one take and post it. And currently there's no intro or outro or music or anything. And that's, it's basically glorified mini suds. Because I'm trying to keep these under half an hour, which, by the way, I should probably stop recording now. Um, but for now, I'm also probably not going to edit out the ums. I was really big on the last episode of ed editing out all my ums and the long spaces. But no, I'm just going to... I'm planning now to just record in one take, leave all the ums and spaces. I'm trying to say um less. <sighs> Anyway, I'm going to end this here.